I'm, I'm freezing. I think David's technology has obviously worked uh, far too well. Um, it's kind of a mental time, isn't it? I'm just going to read uh, a tweet uh, to you um, can a, from this morning. Can a president who tweets the wrong Theresa May be trusted to nuke the right Korea? <laughs> uh, who knows? Um, and, and, and that, I think, almost sums up where we, we sometimes feel we might be today. I mean, think about Bitcoin. Uh, anybody here investing in Bitcoin or holding Bitcoin or Ethereum? I mean, Bitcoin is, and um, crypto is $300 billion uh, value right now, but with incredible volatility, intraday swings of 10 to 15%, which if you got in a year on an asset would be considered significant. So it's kind of this massive asset class, massively volatile. We've not seen that before. Uh, but at the same time, the economic incentives around mining Bitcoin are such that it is driving hardware development in improved chips, which should drive the improvement in, um, in, in silicon that we need to get to artificial general intelligence. So there's this strange set of incentives, this swirling convergence, which I'll come, coming back, come back to. Um, and we've seen the progress in the AI domain in the last uh, talk. You saw how very rapidly computers have gone from being unable to recognize a cat in an image to do it far better than any human and, and much, much more in just in the matter of a few years. So it really does seem like um, the rate of progress is, um, uh, is increasing. And in true form, I'm going to read out another tweet, although I've just, I, I've just got this new phone and I can't work out how to use it. Anyway, so... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to su summarize that tweet, which is um, uh, from, from Lane Green at The Economist. He goes, you may be sitting there with your jaw on the floor um, over what's just happened uh, between Theresa May and, and Donald Trump. I wouldn't bother because something even more unprecedented is going to happen uh, before you finish reading this tweet. Um, and we do live today in a very special day because today is the slowest day that you'll experience uh, it is the slowest day that our economies will experience. It's the day where we will make the least technical progress because tomorrow we're going to do more and tomorrow we'll have the same characteristics of today because the day after uh, will be even more than that. But the question is, um, is that sense of change really real or are we just making it up because we're a bit self-obsessed these days? My clicker appears not to be working. Have I done something wrong? <laughs> oh, it is working. Okay, there we go. Um, so we've had those, uh, those emotions uh, before. If you go back uh, a, a hundred years ago, uh, the march of the machine will make idle hands. So 1908, New York Times, uh, people are going to lose their jobs because of the rapid pace of technology. Um, the horse obsolescing, uh, which uh, it mostly has in the US, um, and how impressive cars are. So we've had this sense that technology moves very, very quickly and we can't keep up. Um, but we actually now have data that unfortunately does demonstrate that things are going faster than ever. So this data that I'm showing up here is from an analyst called Horace Dedew, and he looks at 200 years of industrial development in the US and the rate with which products diffuse into US households. So effectively, that's a penetration rate on the y-axis. Um, and you'll notice three things about this chart. Um, the first thing is that if you go back to 1800 over to the present day, there are many more lines <laughs> on the right-hand side than there are on the left-hand side. That means new consumer products and new technologies are being introduced. The second thing you'll notice is that the steepness of gradient of the lines, especially these, these logistic curves in the exponential component, the beginning part, is getting steeper. In other words, they're more rapidly getting into high market penetration. And the third thing, which is kind of interesting, is that there are clumps of lines. So you can see a clump of lines um, around here, which is after electrification happened in the US, it became really easy to get fridges and washing machines and irons and, and, and so on. Um, but this data shows at a glance what we kind of feel, which is stuff is happening faster than normal. And he hasn't even captured lots of things like Snapchat and Instagram and whatever else is coming next. Um, but if you cast your mind uh, to somebody who was born 100 years before me in the 1870s, they were going to live about 50 years. They were going to probably live in a, on a farm. Uh, they weren't going to travel very far. Uh, they were going to only meet ordinary folk like them. Um, that person will have experienced probably half a dozen new products that would have been introduced during their lifetime that got to mainstream 60, 70, 80% penetration in that 50-year lifespan. So you, you see six new things. Um, pity me. Um, well, I was born in 1972. Um, I'm, don't pity this bit. I'm probably going to live more than 120 years. Um, 
But look at how many things I'm going to have to cope with. I actually lost track of how many lines there were. And as I said, this doesn't cover all of the kind of weird internet services. So we're at a point where we're living longer and the rate of change of kind of things that, are, that fundamentally change the way in which we live our lives um, is increasing. So we have to deal with many more of them. Now, just think about how we consumed media. You know, when I was a kid, uh, we had kind of one TV with three channels, and, and I, had, I taped two back scratches together to make a remote control. Um, and, and, and then we got to the stage where we had a se second TV, a black and white TV, and then we got video recorder. Fast forward about seven different ways of changing how we consume media to my kids who have iPads and, you know, when they have access to them, watch their own content. Now, what we've, seen at, uh, what we've seen on that chart at the start of that is, a, is an exponential curve. And the thing about an exponential curve, it, and it, does, uh, it reflects a mathematical property, which is that the next value that you see is related to the previous value. Most of the world that we live in and that we have seen and experienced follows this blue line. You know, my profits increase by £1,000 every year. But there are certain things that follow this exponential curve. And the thing about an exponential curve is that it's a point of disappointment at the beginning. It's, uh, if you look at any startup, its first five years, it looks really tiny and puny compared to a large incumbent. And then at some point, something happens and it crosses over uh, and you get wonder, amazement and chaos. Um, and the word that business uh, scholars love so much, which is disruption. And one of the things that I've observed is that there are many, many more behaviors that look like this in basic research and in science and in, um, in industrialization and in business than we expected. And many academics have identified that many things that we thought looked like this actually were just the shallow part of the green line. The best example of this is, is Moore's law. So Moore's law is uh, you know, this long-held relationship in computing, which says basically that every year, the amount of computing power you can buy for a dollar uh, de uh, increases by about 60%. I mean, that's a really weird formulation, by the way. You'll have heard it in other ways, but that's the way I've, I like to think about it. That effectively, I spend a dollar next year, and I get 60% more computing. And that relationship is held for about 60 years. What it means is that the computing power that you could afford to buy for, say, $100 in 1972 when I was born was 1,000 times less than the computing power that I could buy in uh, 1990 when I went to university. And then if you look at this graph, which pushes it out another 20 or 30 years, you see a couple of things. The first is that Moore's Law has actually basically continued uh, since then to the point that the computers you could buy a few years ago were 10,000 times more powerful for the same dollar as they were when I went to university, but there are new technical architectures, GPUs, don't worry about them, which are much, much more powerful still. And so today's GPUs are 10 to the 7, which is 10 million times more powerful than the computers of 1990, which in turn were 1,000 times more powerful than the ones uh, when I was born for the same price. But there is this crazy convergence in exponential technology, um, and it's happening in other places. So the way we give, make computers see is we give them CMOS sensors. That's what your iPhone has two or three of right on the front. That's a camera. Uh, since the launch of the iPhone, the number of CMOS sensors we've been shipping has been growing at a rate of about 15% per year. So it's a sort of shallow exponential rate uh, to the point that by 2019, there'll be nearly 50 billion different digital camera sensors in operation. And what we heard in one of the earlier talks is that that, uh, that imagery is now digital and can be processed and understood and acted on by a computer. Um, we're also seeing, separately, the growth in the number of devices connected to the internet. And, and Sophie, at the beginning, talked about this, where by 2025, there'll be about 70 billion devices, 10 for each human uh, on the planet. That's an annualized rate of 17%, compounding interest. I wish my bank gave me that rate. Um, and those things will all be internet connected, and there will be that super cheap processing power sitting behind them. And they're quite likely to have cameras on them so they can read the world. I'm not so good with this. Okay. Um, of course, we don't want them to be plugged in, and we want to be able to carry our power with us, and that's dependent on lithium-ion battery storage, which has traditionally been quite expensive. But you know this story already. In 2010, it cost $1,000 for a kilowatt hour of, of, of lithium-ion battery power. Um, that's declining at 19% year on year, so it's another exponential decline. So as of now, 
the prices are about a fifth of where they were seven years ago, and we expect them to get to about a tenth within a 10-year period. And all of these things are compounding. And we're turning other types of uh, domains into digital domains. We first sequenced the human genome back in 2001, and it cost $100 million. Today, it costs about $1,000. Uh, and if the human genome sequencing prices had kept pace with Moore's law, quite amazing relationship, which has built the whole of the computer industry, it would have followed that red line. But actually, it's not. It's followed this line here. And of course, not to be left out, the uh, material scientists wanted to get into the, into the game as well. So Andrew Geim uh, you know, figured out graphene in 2004. The global graphene market is growing at a 30% rate. And that rate is, gonna, that rate is reflecting, uh, reflective both on demand, but also economies of scale and new techniques that allow us to manufacture this wonder material uh, in, in other unheard of ways. So that demand is reflective both of uh, sorry, that number is reflective both on great demand and on a declining price. And then we can look even further out and out in, out in space, maybe not as far as the asteroids, but traditionally space has been a, a government game, and certainly in the area of Earth observation, it's generally been a government's game with governments launching satellites. Well, what we've seen in this, in this chart is this sudden uptick of private satellite constellation clusters. And in fact, the largest operator of Earth observation satellites is now not a government. It's a private company that can map the Earth, every point on the Earth, four times a day and deliver that information back down to us. It's kind of exhausting. My slides are always out of date. Um, if you go back to think about, well, what does this mean? Think back to where we were 10 years ago. Uh, and just looking at the internet, I mean, YouTube, probably not everybody in this room was using YouTube uh, 10 years ago, and now we almost certainly are. Netflix streaming service didn't even exist, uh, and now it's you know, where a lot of us spend a lot of our time. Um, cryptocurrencies didn't exist. There's now $300 billion worth of value in them. The amount of data we were creating annually is this sort of mythical number of 0.1 zettabytes. The thing to focus on is we're creating 200 times as much. And the next 10 years, we will increase that by more than 200. So that's what the last decade has been. And, and we've been so busy updating our phones and swiping the, the notifications, we haven't had a chance to look back and realize how quickly things are changing. Um, so what's gonna, the next decade of exponential change going to, going to hold? If that was a last decade and that was a slow, slow period. So I have some ideas, but I only have 15 minutes, so we don't get a chance to go into them. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, <laughs> But I will give you some hints. Um, so the first thing is I think we may well solve renewable energy. And by solve, what I mean is that we'll get it to a point where the economics of it are such that the economic incentive to invest in renewable rather than non-renewable will exist. So we got to this point, um, uh, or we're very close to this point, where the solar benchmark is reliably better price-wise than the coal or gas benchmarks. And the thing about solar and, um, solar and wind is that getting better and better, these sort of lines down here, where, whereas coal is kind of s sat where it is. So that by, by this point, there's going to be zero incentive, right, to do anything with coal and to, to on-stream another coal power station. We might also get to this idea of the second death of distance. This is a weird one, right? So we're familiar with the first death of distance. That happened with the arrival of the internet and Skype and things like that, which means we could you know, Skype our grandkids to, our, to their grannies uh, wherever they were in the world. Um, but the second death of distance comes with something like 3D printing. So in the, the game of 3D printing, do we need to ship stuff on big tankers around the world? Do we need to be highly integrated and highly globalized, or do we just need feedstock because everything is actually going to be produced in our, in our high streets. Um, and so this is a scenario from ING, uh, which is a bank, which says, look, if 3D printing really, really does improve, by the way, it almost certainly will, because we've always been astonished by what this stuff does, the effect on world trade will be a net negative $56 trillion. So you get these weird effects that you couldn't have predicted at the start of the presentation. Uh, oops. Okay, um, another thing that will, will happen is that, that the continued shift of people into dense agglomerations that we call cities will, will go on. I mean, we've heard this idea that 51% of the world now lives in cities. Actually, it's a kind of weird definition. For, for in some countries, they can consider a city as anything with more than 2,000 people, which in London you call Westfield before it's opened. <laughs> um, 
So, so it's not, but it's, it's going to continue. Now, what happens when people live in, in cities where there's much more interconnectedness? You get a number of interesting superlinear effects. So the one is that wages grow faster than the population. So you double the size of a population, average wages will grow, <laughs> grow by more than two. Um, even things like creative employment grows in a superlinear way. So you double the size of a population of a city, and you will increase the number of theatre directors. Um, but there are some other things that, that sort of start to happen as well. So as cities get bigger, you end up seeing um, a disproportionate growth in the amount of pollution, a disproportionate uh, amount of uh, crime, and, and certain types of of diseases, and these are well observed by complexity scientists looking at hundreds, thousands of cities over long periods of time. And um, as we get into these agglomerations, we're kind of physically more proximate, but also things like Tinder and Facebook help us close the distance between us and other people. And, and so you get this effect that we've started to see where, in America, this is data, which shows that since the internet showed up and since people started to densify you're more likely to know people who have different physical characteristics to you. You know more people of different gender, of a different religion, and of a different, uh, of a different race, but curiously less so of education. I'll get to that. So you get this interconnectedness where you can appreciate difference. But it also has a, a sort of slight, slight dark side, which is that the, air, the ways in which we choose to group are about our beliefs. And so you get this effect, effect called homophily, which means birds, birds of a feather flock together. If you get too much flocking, you get polarization. And so a natural impact of the interconnectedness that allows us to um, look over obvious physical dis differences has a strange effect where we tend to cluster by our beliefs. Um, and so one of the things that we've started to see as a result of online dating, which is sort of highly interconnected, is a rise in interracial marriage. Uh, in, uh, uh, but we've also seen a decline in inter-educational level, attainment level marriage. Um, and and so, so that's particularly affected um, in the States, certainly the data, women with lower levels of education because Tinder doesn't allow them to date up, uh, as it were. So there are these strange sorting um, um, polarization uh, dynamics as well. Um, so my mantra really is, is this, you know, if change is the new constant, then adaptation is really what matters. You know, when, when the, the meteorite hits Yucatan, uh, the, 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 the animals that are able to adapt to the new environment are the ones that, that survive. Um, and, and I, you know, I kind of often feel that this is a platitude to say in 25 seconds, but, but effectively, if the world is getting more complex and getting more complex more quickly then you need to have some skills to adapt to it. And I kind of think there are three or four, right? So the, the, the key ones are um, meta-learning, which is the ability to learn, uh, metacognition, which is the, to, to the ability to think about how your ability to learn, um, computational thinking, which is your ability to solve problems in a, in a structured way, um, and, and then also complex social skills, because in a world that gets incre increasingly roboticized, and a world that gets increasingly algorithmic, your points of reference are going to be working with, with other people. And the, the, I started at the beginning saying quite often we look at that green line and that blue line and we focused on the linear, linear line and we think the exponential curve is something that doesn't really exist. And if you look at this data which shows world productive output from 1950 to 2006, it looks like a straight line, doesn't it? Sorry about that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the last two slides. Um, but when you zoom back out on that, what you see is we were just looking at the wrong time period because that's where that straight line lived. If you go back to the year zero, you see my familiar friendly curve. Um, and if you go back even further, back to two million, I don't know how they did this, but they did, um, <laughs> you see an amazing chunk in world output. We also see it in biological systems. So when you look at the size of the human cranial capacity, it was basically growing linearly for about 8 million years, and then we kind of mastered technology, and boom, we tripled it in size in less than 2 million. So a lot of this is making people a bit uneasy. Um, so my favorite data, data point on this is this exponential growth, which is a growth of number of peer-reviewed mindfulness uh, academic papers, because we're not the only ones who are saying, holy hell, om shanti, and let's relax. Thank you. <laughs>